Hi everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, depending on where, uh, uh, where you are. Today we are together with Christian Wade and he's going to walk us through the uh, famous ALM toolkit. Uh, I, I think everyone knows about Christian. He is the technical manager at uh, Power BI and Azure Analysis Services product team. Uh, I can say that he is one of the technical gods of Power BI. <laughs> uh, you, I think that's that that's short introduction is more than enough. We are listening to you. You can ask anything about Power BI and uh, Azure Analysis Services. It doesn't have to be related with LM only. You can ask any question. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, Thank you so much, Halil. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, for the, not just the kind words, but just for setting up the event and the opportunity to talk to people, you know, all over the world. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, so Halil uh, already introduced me. You know, I, I own basically my, my program management team owns the semantic modeling capability uh, for Power BI datasets, as well as Azure Analysis Services and SQL Server Analysis Services. So and that doesn't just include the analysis services features that includes uh, uh, features for um, for performance and scalability like you know aggregations and integration with synapse and things like that so let me just check what happened here to my screen okay so uh alm toolkit uh it, it it's based on a tool called bism normalizer that that i built a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away in a, uh, it seems like another incarnation now. Um, and so Bism Normalizer uh, runs uh, as an extension in Visual Studio and it works with uh, SQL Server Data Tools, the, the tabular uh, designer for SQL Server Data Tools. And um, it's a schema compare tool, uh, much like uh, many of the other relational database schema compare tools. Uh, on the market today. It's a pretty big uh, area. And then um, I built the LM toolkit. It's actually part of the same build as Bism Normalizer. You know, if I fix a bug uh, in, in, in how it, you know, runs its logic, if I fix a bug, it will fix it in both. And uh, the differences between <coughs> Bism Normalizer and LM toolkit is that LM Toolkit doesn't run in Visual Studio because most Power BI users don't use Visual Studio. So it's more geared for Power BI than analysis services. And um, the reason it's got this Mac software logo here is that this control here, this differences grid, is a different uh, one than the one in, in, um, in BISM Normalizer. The one in BISM Normalizer is WinForms based. And so uh, this one is actually Chromium based. So there's a local Chromium instance, just like with Power BI Desktop, when you create your reports in Power BI Desktop, it's running a local Chromium instance, which is why it's actually running the same kind of TypeScript code that can run in a browser. And that's why when you publish your report to the service, you see exactly the same experience uh, as when you created the report in Power BI Desktop, because it really is because Power BI Desktop is hosted in a local Chromium instance, like a little web browser. And that's exactly what this is doing as well, right? So this is all TypeScript based. This can be hosted in a browser uh, one day. And this is actually using the Monaco diff control, which is used in uh, Visual Studio Code. So um, it, it's, it's a lot more challenging to put a Chromium instance in uh, Visual Studio uh, uh, Visual Studio.net, not not uh, 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 the Visual Studio Code. Um, so uh, that that's the the bit of the history, all right? And so the use cases that you would use it for, um, it's quite a similar concept to deployment pipelines that you may have seen in Power BI. Now it's actually getting a lot of usage deployment pipelines because the deployment pipelines. Um, uh, lets you deploy across environments like development, test and production for application lifecycle management, but it does it in a very kind of visual and guided way. It's what we call a low code, no code experience, right? So uh, uh, we, we also support the traditional experience that you have, you know, you can check, you, you can integrate with DevOps and have automated CICD uh, build and deployment. Um, but a low code, no code experience is geared to that, you know, Power BI, uh, it, 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 its roots is as a self-service BI tool. It's matured to have lots of enterprise BI capabilities. It's now 
almost a superset of announced services. There's many additional um, uh, enterprise BI features in Power BI that be over and above analysis services, but it still works. It's one platform that does it all. It works for self-service and enterprise BI. So we always, when we build the feature in Power BI, we try to look at it from the lens of, okay, uh, just because uh, this is gonna be used uh, by a lot of uh, pro developers and, and things, we need to make sure it works for all of their scenarios, but it doesn't make sense to make things more complicated than what they need to be. And so that's the approach that we took with deployment pipelines. Over time, you'll see GitHub integration and automation of uh, uh, hooks for deployment pipelines. But basically, it gives you a diff of everything in each of the environments, development, test, and production, and you can pick and choose what you want to deploy. And it, it has guardrails, so it checks you know, the dependency tree. It makes sure that you don't deploy a report that depends on a data set that you chose not to deploy that doesn't exist or, or, or whatever. So it's a very similar concept uh, to deployment pipelines. It's also very similar to schema compare in SSDT and other relational schema compare tools like Redgate SQL Compare that now ships in Visual Studio. This has been around for decades now, which is just a relational database schema compare. You know, you have things like DAT packs to deploy SQL databases, um, and ultimately they're based on the same kind of infrastructure as schema compare uh, in, in SQL Server data tools, and a lot of like deployments of um, uh, uh, data warehouses will generate a script that, you know, you can't drop and, drop and recreate the data warehouse every time you do a deployment. You know, you want to retain all of the data and you want to just add, create a script that's going to add the extra columns or extra tables and make the changes whilst you still retain the historical data. So it's very, very similar concept to, to these tools, but it's for Power BI data sets and, and analysis services models, okay? Um, you can use it to, so some of the really useful use cases that we're seeing a lot of people use it for now is to incrementally refresh changes uh, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for, for metadata only deployment for, for when you're doing incremental refresh and you have a bunch of, you have a lot of historical data in, in the, the, the data set that's in the service. I'll, I'll demo this uh, shortly. You have a lot of data, you don't want to lose it. You just want to uh, create a new measure or make a change to some DAX objects. You don't want to have to, to reload all of that historical data. So it's very good for those cases where you just want to make some, some metadata changes and you don't want to uh, uh, touch anything that's already there, right? You can use it for uh, diff and merge across repos, across branches. You, you can use it in, in multi-development developer environments. You know, the thing is that um, it, you, it, it's not as simple as just a JSON merge. So if you have a repo, for example, you have a repo for your bug fix branch for production, or you have repos for different uh, developers, different versions of the model, and you want to uh, merge those into the main branch or, or whatever you want to do. And it's not as simple as just a, a, J, a simple JSON merge in Visual Studio Code because there's many interdependencies between all of the objects, right? It's uh, it, like you, you can have a, a relationship that refers to a column that doesn't exist. Um, or there's many, many different validations that, that this tool does to make sure that the, the resulting uh, uh, model metadata is not just clean JSON, but it will actually load into the analysis services engine. All right. Um, you can reuse common objects across uh, tablet models. I was just talking to Hello about this. And um, it's, it's kind of similar to composite models where you want to reuse different uh, components of different models, but it will create local metadata, right? So it won't be uh, in direct query mode uh, where it's going to combine things on the fly, which maybe if you're combining multiple large semantic models, maybe you've got conformed dimensions that you want to share across uh, different tablet models. Uh, you don't want to be querying those at runtime on the, the large scale uh, deployments to, to boost performance. In some cases you might, but in most cases you want to you want to copy that metadata, copy that conformed dimension metadata, put it in your local model uh, so that everything is local and, and performs really well if, you, if you're loading the data into memory. All right. Uh, you can, and you can use it to for things like just just general model management. Like we've seen this from many many years ago, like ten years ago, with like import from Power Pivot into analysis services. People would prototype in Power Pivot, and then when they're ready, they would bring that uh, uh, model into analysis services. But then when you bring it into to to, to you, you need to not only bring it into and their services or bring you, you need to, to to combine it with your existing semantic models because you're 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 you, you want to promote uh, reusability right so obviously you're going to iterate 
when you do this process, you're going to conform with naming standards and, you know, data architecture and everything. But it, it, it gives you a, a, a starting point that you can iterate on and accelerate the process and, and help kind of bridge the gap between self-service and corporate BI. And you can run it from a command line. Some people are running it from uh, uh, um, from um, uh, DevOps uh, build and deployment pipelines. OK, so with that, uh, before I go to the next slide, I'll just pause there for a minute, see if there's any questions or anything. Uh, not yet. OK, sure. OK, so then to, to use this, you need to install the tool um, and you, you also need to use the XMLA endpoint because it's going to make changes to the data set using the XMLA endpoint. So uh, you can go to the, the, the Power BI Premium capacity and enable it. It works in premium per user. Uh, I think you, you all know about the announcement that has just gone out with the, the pricing. So uh, the, yeah, this, the XMLA endpoint works in premium per user. Therefore, uh, LM Toolkit works in premium per user. And uh, I anticipate a significant increase in usage because of premium per user. You know, I've had a lot of people asking, well, I can't I use this in pro? Well, no, you can't use it in pro, unfortunately, uh, but you, you can use it in premium per user. So it's the next best thing. So uh, I, I, I suspect there'll be a lot of uh, increased usage because of that. All right. Um, then uh, it's recommended, but not required to set uh, the large model storage format as well. So this is something that XML endpoint and large models is generally available as of around the, the holidays just a couple of months ago. And so the, the large model storage format, it doesn't just mean that your data sets can go beyond 10 gigabytes, right? So premium per user has a 100 gigabyte limit, right? Uh, in, including the, the space to, to refresh the model. So it doesn't just mean that your data sets can go beyond 10 gigabytes. It also means that the way that the, even if you have like a, a five gigabyte data set, anything greater than one gigabyte, right? There might be some benefits you want to consider with the, with this large uh, uh, data set storage format. Because the way that the, 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 the data set is stored in the service is different, right? Uh, it stores it kind of like it does for analysis services. If you've seen the uh, SQL Server analysis services installation with the local data folder and all of those files that it puts in there, right? With a, with a file for every column, et cetera, um, with a ton of files. That's how it does it in Azure Analytics Services as well. We put it in blob storage. And then when you do this, when Power BI Premium actually stores it in Azure Premium files, not Power BI Premium, but there's a there's a, an Azure service called Azure Premium Files. And then we put those same Analytics Services files in Azure Premium files. And that means that uh, XMLA updates are going to, transactions like adding a measure to the data set is going to be much faster. Because if you don't enable this, then what it does is it creates a uh, uh, um, it, it, it creates an ABF backup uh, every time you do a refresh or every time you make a change to the, the model. Now, if you've got a five gigabyte model, that creating that backup might take 10 minutes, right? So this can make it much, much faster. The caveat of this and XMLA endpoint updates uh, and therefore and ALM toolkit that I was just discussing with Halil is that you can't currently today, you can't download the model to PBIX. Right, where we were, we're talking about this about about enabling this. We know that everyone wants this, uh, but today, for for the downside of of setting the large data set storage format and for using XMLA updates uh, and LM toolkit, is you can't download the 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 the, the file to the, the, can't download the the PBIX. And the primary reason for that is what I was just describing, which is that when you don't use this format, um, it's going to create an ABF uh, backup. Right, but then so what we'll probably do with this and for XML updates is just that you do a download to PBIT and we just need to do some work in Power Desktop so that it, it doesn't it's it's resilient to changes in the data set metadata that Power Desktop didn't create itself. Right. So right now, uh, Power Desktop is very, very protect protective of the metadata. If you've ever tried to crack open a PBIX as a zip file and try to modify it, you'll notice that Power Desktop won't reopen it, right? It's very, very stubborn that way. And the reason is that it can't guarantee that it's not going to break. Uh, if even if you even if you make changes that are legitimate changes in terms of the the tablet object model metadata, like you add a measure or something, right? Um, then 
it, 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 Pair Desktop still can't guarantee that it's not going to break because there's a lot of assumptions that it makes, internal kind of assumptions that it, that it makes. So we need to clean that up. We were talking about this yesterday. Uh, we, we, we really want to make Pair Bear Desktop uh, uh, work with metadata that wasn't necessarily generated by Pair Bear Desktop so that your target of an ALM toolkit comparison can be a Pair Bear Desktop file. Uh, you can download to PBIT for large models. Uh, you can extract the data from Pabbear Desktop like you can today. You can check it into source control. But then if you want to roll back to a previous version, you can get that data and you can reopen it in Pabbear Desktop again, right? So all these things are going to be enabled once we, we do this work, right? So we're, we're, we're actively talking about uh, uh, creating a plan for this. This is actually something I'm going to do today is I'm going to put a plan together to present to the leadership team of how we can address this, right? So, all right. So. Uh, then to, to, to use ALM Toolkit, uh, it's a very simple tool. It actually does a lot of complex things in the background, but uh, to use it, there's just like five buttons or so, or five or six buttons, and uh, I'll demo. It's very, very simple uh, to use. All right, so I can go into a demo, but I'll just pause again and see if there's any uh, questions or anything or comments or and, and anything you want to talk about. Uh, there, there, there isn't any question yet, Christian. Okay. Can okay. No worries. No problem. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Adam. So uh, I'm here in uh, a tool that you may know called Power Desktop, which when you're in Teams you can't you can't click on. Uh, there we go. All right. So uh, this is my uh, 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 semantic model, right? So I created it in Power Desktop, not in SSDT, and uh, the version that is up in the service. Uh, I, I use, I'm using Pabbar Desktop as a semantic model authoring tool. Um, so the version of this model that is up in the service maybe has got 3 billion rows. And I often do a demo with 3 billion rows and 70 gigabytes of compressed data, which is about 1.8 terabytes of data in its raw uncompressed form. And uh, that, that actually runs on a P3 with uh, 70, a 70 gigabyte model. So that would run on a PPU size, right? Um, and so uh, uh, let, let's say this, this model is up in the service. It has, you know, uh, uh, three billion rows. There's uh, thousands of users using it and there's thousands of reports. Many of the reports, I don't even know what reports are on there because people are creating new reports on top of it all of the time. I've got users in different countries. And so this is the kind of semantic model uh, um, kind of uh, uh, flow that you have. Uh, you try and reduce the number of, of data sets to maximize the, the reach and maximize the reusability, maximize the efficiency of doing the ETL once and promote that single version of the truth, right? So, so let's say this data set is up in the service. Now it's 70 gigabytes. I, I, I obviously can't create a 70 gigabyte data set here locally on my desktop, right? I, I, I could show you my memory. I don't have that much memory on my machine. Um, so uh, what do I do? I use incremental refresh, right? So I set up incremental refresh so that the, the data that I have here locally in Power Desktop is very small, just maybe uh, uh, 50 megabytes or something. And I've only got like maybe two or three days of data here locally in Power Desktop. I can validate the, 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 the report of uh, report or validate the data, but I've only got a, kind of like a sample of the data, right? So this game table is the one with um, uh, 3 billion rows uh, for, for the whole data set, but I'm only loading like one or two days of data so I've only got like maybe, I don't know, uh, 50 or 100 megabytes locally, right? So to do that, I need to use incremental refresh. You may be familiar with it. So I set up, uh, I have to set up a couple of um, uh, uh, Power Query parameters, range start, range in. I've set those up. Uh, th then I can enable incremental refresh. If I went to another table that didn't have that, it'd say you, you need to set up the, the parameters, right, with a learn more link. But I've already set it up for the game table. And I've said, look, when I publish this to the service, you're going to take my little 50 megabyte file. You're going to put it up in the service. Um, before, I, before I even invoke a refresh, right, I'm, I'm probably going to want to make sure that it's got its large models format enabled, because otherwise when it gets to 10 gigabytes, it will give me an error, right? So it's going to say, sorry, you can't have a, 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 a Power data set over 10 gigabytes unless you enable the large model storage format. So the first thing I would do is I would, I, when I'm bootstrapping the system, let's say I already bootstrapped the system a, a while ago. So I, I, I published the data set. I enabled the large model storage format. Then I invoked the first ever refresh on this data set. Maybe this was six months before. And then it loaded 10 years of data, right? 
And it, the, the, the first refresh maybe took two or three hours because it loaded all of the historical data. And then every time I do a new refresh, it's going to refresh just one day at a time, right? It's going to just do a rolling window and keep adding one day at a time. And then once uh, you know the, the full 10 years has gone out of uh, range, it will lose the 11 year ago uh, year, et cetera, right? So that's how you set up incremental refresh, right? And it's much, much faster. So the first refresh is going to take maybe up to three hours, but then subsequent refreshes in some cases, because it's only going to refresh one day, may take 10 minutes or, or something like that, right? So that's the idea. So I've set this up already, right? Then I added some, maybe I added some measures. I maybe I used tabular editor and I added some translations, etc. And so now I want to publish my changes. I've already got the version in the service, but I want to publish the changes. Like the I've I've added some measures, right? And or actually I actually added some calculation groups using tabular editor, right? So now I'm going to click publish, all right? And then I select my workspace. And then it says, do I want to replace the data set? And I really don't want to replace the data set. Why? Because, like I said, the version I have here is 50 megabytes. If I if I replace the data set, it will take the 50 megabyte version and it will replace the 70 gigabyte version. And I will lose all of the historical data and I will need to wait three hours to reload all of the historical data. And my users who are using the system right now will be impacted. Right. And that's assuming yeah, you know, everything goes according to plan, right? So I really don't want to do that. So what, what can I do? So I'm going to click this view impact button or link, and it's going to take me up to the Power BI service, and it's going to show me the lineage view that we introduced about a year ago now. And so the lineage view is really cool. It sh shows you all of the interdependencies uh, between all of the, the um, objects or the artifacts in the workspace from uh, data source and data flow and data set and report and dashboard and it actually shows you uh, the dependencies across different workspaces as well right and this is actually the same meta lineage information that we have fed through to um, Azure purview that actually shows you the exact same lineage information but in the context of all of your uh, uh, architecture assuming it's on 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 the Microsoft stack even though even Azure purview is 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 working with non Microsoft uh, data sources now as well. Uh, but the point being that in this lineage view, it's limited just to uh, Power BI. I can get cross cross workspace dependencies, but when it's in purview, it covers your entire architecture, right? So I can see here the the data set, and and it, it, if I had like uh, maybe hundreds of reports and thousands of users, I'd see all of the the related workspaces li listed here with all of the reports. If I'm going to deploy a new version of this data set. I can notify the, the the report owners that I'm gonna you know add some new cool feature to this this data set or whatever, right? And so in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come into the settings and premium tab, and then here you can see not only do I have the large models that so this is the default. So when I put a new data set, it will automatically be large models. You can go into the data set settings and change it per data set if you want. But also the, the main reason I came in here is to show you that we have this workspace connection, right? So this workspace connection is what we use in place of the, the analysis services server name. This is what with the, with the XML endpoints, this gives us access to the analysis services engine that is in the Power BI data set, right? So this is what the XML endpoint is, is going to give you access through this uh, 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 the, 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 this uh, workspace connection will give us access through the XML endpoint to the uh, uh, analysis services engine behind the data set, right? So I'll go ahead and copy this, right? Now I go back to Power BI Desktop. I will cancel out of here because I don't want to do that. That's not a good idea. And what do I do now? So I come over to external tools. And uh, as you can see, we've got a bunch of external tools now. They've just like it's grown virally. You can create your own external tools. You know, you can do all sorts of things with it like that. I didn't even imagine like someone created one that is going to connect with Tableau to the data set. <laughs> Just in case you have a, you have a, a Tableau report uh, and uh, maybe you've got certain users in certain departments somewhere that are using non Microsoft data visualization tools. Like I said, this is a semantic model with thousands of users using it in the world. It's inevitable that some users, not everyone might be using Power BI. Obviously over time, we are confident that they will gravitate to Power BI once they 
you know, understand the value proposition of Power BI as a data visualization tool. But in the meantime, that's fine. We have an open platform architecture. We're not like uh, uh, protective, like we're not like Power BI Desktop is protective of its metadata, right? We're, we're an open platform architecture and we want to correct Power BI Desktop soon as well. Anyway, so people create all of these um, uh, 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 external tools and you can do all sorts of interesting things. And then uh, you've got obviously DAC Studio. Uh, you, you open up DAC Studio and you're immediately, I, I mean, you've probably seen the, the you know, Darren Gospel, Marco Russo and uh, Daniel Otikia talk about this. So this is now connected to the local um, uh, data set. Um, I can open up Tablet Editor, you know, which is created by Daniel Otikia, who actually created the Daniel Otikia, um, Daniel Otikia uh, created uh, 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 the, the the external tools ribbon as part of the the Power BI contributor program. So all of these tools, I open them up and they're immediately connected to uh, the same data set that I have here in Power BI Desktop, right? So I'm going to open up Alien Toolkit, and so you can run just like that Studio and Tablet Editor. You can run. You can run them as a standalone tool or you can have them integrated into Power BI Desktop. So in this case, I've, I've opened it up from Power BI Desktop. So it's, it knows that it was open from Power BI Desktop. So it's made the source be the Power BI Desktop uh, uh, dataset. It could have been a data set in the service or it could have been uh, a file. It could have been like a, a BIM file in a, from analysis services or um, uh, a, a PBIT, right? It can pick, pick up a PBIT. But in this case, it's, it knows that because I launched it from Power BI Desktop, it's automatically set the source to be the data set from Power BI Desktop. And in this case, my target will be uh, the, the, the data set in the service, right? Now, I could, I could make the target be Power BI Desktop, but then I've got the same problems about there's only certain bits of metadata that the Tablet Editor and ALM Toolkit are allowed to modify in, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Power BI Desktop, which is, you know, measures, calculation groups, uh, translations and perspectives. Um, so uh, and and OLS rules now as well. You may have seen the object level security has just been launched, and you can use Tablet Editor for that now as well, right? So anyway, I'll go ahead and perform this comparison. My source is desktop. My target is the version in the service. You can see here that this is the same uh, workspace connection that we had that we copied, right? And then it, I, I've already selected the the the. It already remembered the data set. But I could, if I um, click here and connect, you'll see the same list of data sets that was in that workspace. Right. Um, there you go. So that there's a ton of data sets there. So I'll go ahead and just use that one. Go ahead and perform the comparison. So now it's going to do uh, a schema diff, right? So if I make this a little bit bigger, let me just bring this up here. And so the, it lists all of the objects. It supports all of the objects we've got. You know, um, uh, M expressions. We've got uh, uh, calculation groups. We've got, you know, obviously measures, relationships, and translations, and you know, uh, KPIs and everything, right? So uh, I'm gonna. It's it, it's when when I have something that is already the same in the source and the target, it's just gonna say same definition, and I can't change it, and it, and it looks exactly the same. But if, if it's like a new item or it's going to be updated or it's going to be deleted, then I can have an action associated with it, right? So as you can see here, this, this uh, calculation item doesn't exist, so I have the option to create it. And then this game table is the one with the incremental refresh policy, right? And you can see that the version in the target, the version in the service has a bunch of partitions generated. And uh, I, I do not want to lose those partitions because if I lose the partitions, I will lose the data in them and it will take you three hours to reload all of that data. So I can have it automatically retain the partitions, right, based on a policy here. There's many policies you can do, including like your refresh options when you do the deployment. Uh, but I will, I will leave that, I'll, uh, instead of doing it that way, I'm going to just go ahead and skip the whole game table. And now it's not going to touch the game table at all. Like the game table will just be untouched. In fact, there may be many things here that are just not ready to deploy yet, right? Because I'm still working on them. This is like effectively my development environment. I'm not ready to deploy. I just need to push like a bug fix or something. I don't want to deploy all of these things. So I'm going to just skip them all in one go, right? And, uh, and let's skip this guy as well. So I've got a lot of skipped items. I'm going to actually hide the skipped objects with same definitions. 
I can see everything that, I, I, that, that is different. I can see the items that I just skipped, uh, but I can't see the things that are the same now. Right? And then here we've got a, this trip table and it's asking me, do I want to delete it? And so in the cases where like maybe you have a conform dimension, like a customer dimension or a date dimension, and you want to uh, reuse that and put it in another model. So typically your other model is going to have like maybe hundreds of objects in there or the, even thousands, and you don't want to touch any of them. You don't want to delete any of them. You just want to pick that uh, customer, that dimension, that date dimension. You want to take that, that dimension and put it in your, your existing model, right? So, in, so you would want to uh, skip all of the deletions, right? So I could skip them all individually, right? And then I come in here, maybe I, I skip a, a couple here and there, uh, but then I need to do them all manually. So what I'm going to do instead is if I delete that again, I'm back where I was a minute ago, I'm going to say skip all objects missing in source, right? And then everything that, that, that is missing in source with the delete action item gets skipped, even if I have thousands of them, right? Which, like I say, when you're reusing objects like conform dimensions, this can be quite useful. All right, so I've skipped all of that. So now I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to hide all of the skip objects even the ones that I manually skipped to so just focus only on what I'm going to actually apply, what I'm going to actually do here, right? So I've got the, the I've got this translation, right? That has Brazilian Portuguese and some other translations uh, languages. And then I'm going to create this calculation group. And uh, so everything's good. I go ahead and validate the selection. And this is what I was talking about, like deployment pipelines. It has guardrails to ensure that you don't break the system, right? Even the relational schema compare tools, they allow you to like have a table that already has data in it and you create a new column that, and you make it non-nullable and it will give you an error when you run the script. So the goal here is to never give you an error when you run the script, right? It, 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 it will put validation to make sure that, you know, you don't, you, like I said before, this is much more uh, complex than just a simple JSON merge, right? Valid JSON, it may be valid JSON, but it may not load into the analysis services engine. You need to check all of the dependencies, like the, the foreign key refers to a column that exists or, or whatever it is. So an example, if, if I show this model has discouraged implicit measures uh, set to false in the target, I need it to be set to true so that I can create the calculation group, right? But let's say I didn't know that, so I just skipped it, right? And now I run the validation again. And now it says, sorry, you can't create a calculation group because you don't have discouraged implicit measures set to true. And then it said, oh, because you don't have the calculation group, then you can't create the calculation items either, right? So if I if I just skip the calculation group, I would have still not been able to, to create the calculation items. So it does this whole analysis. It's gonna check like, if you have a table with an, uh, an M expression that depends on another an M expression that depends on another M expression that, doesn't exist, then none of those things will the, the whole the whole dependency tree will say, sorry, you can't you can't uh, uh, make those changes because otherwise you'll break the system. Right. So it, it has this validation just like deployment pipelines. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, update this again. And now I run this again. And now we we're, we're in good shape again. Now I can report the differences to Excel, just, you know, this is useful sometimes just to check what is different across models, or you can use it for auditing to, as part of your deployment process to keep a record, uh, or you can generate a script, uh, which will, you can open in SSMS. It'll be a tabular model scripting language or Timsel script, like a, a create or replace script, right? And that you can open up in SQL Server Management Studio. And if you don't wanna run this on production right now, you have a process, you can hand that script over. Um, or you can just go ahead and update uh, the target directly, which is what I'll go ahead and do. So it's going to create the calculation group and uh, the translations or the cultures uh, in that data set. And it's already done that. And now it's just doing a process recalc. I'm not going to go into the, all the processing options right now, but you can process just the individual tables. You can do a process default. Uh, you can do a process full. You have lots of options there. So I've just done a process recap so that it didn't actually query the source for any data, but it just make, made sure that the, the model uh, can be queried. So having done that, um, it will now ask me to refresh the comparison. I'll say yes. And now you can see that uh, everything that, that I, I pushed to the target, like the calculation group, the, the model is now discouraged implicit measures. The calculation group is there. 
the 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 uh, translations of of are there, um, and the, everything that I skipped is still skipped. It, it's still different, right? So here's the the game table. Uh, it, it's still got the, all of the partitions in the in the target, right? So it just didn't touch what I told it not to touch, and it, and it just pushed what I, I told it to push, right? So uh, so that's all good. Now what am I going to do? Now I'm going to go ahead and save this, um, and let me put it in my uh, downloads. I actually have I'll, I'll replace this one. So I'll save this, and so I saved it as an LMT file, right? And now uh, if if I actually Real, I've closed the LM toolkit and I'm going to go to the file and I'm going to open this file that I just created. I'm not doing it from the external tools ribbon this time, right? I'm doing it from the file and now I, it remembers the source and the target, right? In this case, the desktop has to be open because the source was Pi desktop. That model has to be open in desktop. Um, but it remembers the source and the target, but it remembers everything else as well, right? So it's going to remember like uh, the exact options that I had selected when I did the comparison. It's going to remember the exact skip items that I had skipped, right? And so the reason this is useful is that when you are deploying across environments, many of the parameters are the same every time, right? And you don't want to like say, oh, I, I, I blew up, I, I lost the partitions and I had to reload the data because I forgot and I had this thing unchecked. Or you want everything to be exactly the same. You want to minimize manual intervention as much as possible. So you can skip uh, it remembers it, or like if you have like a role that has different membership in test and production, you always want to skip it or the same object you always want to skip, right? You have that very fine grained control to say instead of like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to never touch any roles. You can pick individual roles, but then it remembers exactly which ones you skipped and it remembers all of the settings and now you can rerun this. Uh, uh, so the way that, that people used to do it in the old days with uh, SSDT was you could you could create a, a new uh, tablet model comparison. So it created a new file here. So I already got this one open. So you can have a separate one of these for development, one for test and one for production, uh, etc. So this is the old version of the, the, the control. That is the WinForms version. So with that, I think that's the end of my demo, Halil. Uh, so I, I I think I'm I'm good at this point in terms of the demo. Like any questions or anything? Uh, thank you, Christian. We have a question from Leon, my friend. Uh, what are the pros and cons of using LM toolkit in a multi-developer environment, moving away from a PBX file to BIM file? Yeah. So I mean, that's the traditional way is like using using the BIM file, and then with the BIM file, you have many many options, right? You can that that some of them are not yet available in Pabe Desktop, um, which is you know uh, the integration with source control, the automated deployment. You can have uh, CI/CD. You can use diff and merge with LM Toolkit or BISM Normalizer. Uh, you 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 have all of this extra metadata management capability for application lifecycle management. Um, but the problem today, as, as we discussed earlier, is that you can choose Pabe Desktop for, it's, it's probably got the nicest modeling experience, but uh, with a really nice diagram and lots of, you know, the aggregations dialog has got lots of validation and incremental refresh. You know, there's some things like incremental refresh and aggregations that only Pabe Desktop can do as well as it does. Um, but then you you can't get that metadata management thing. So what you can do, one option is if you want to use Pabia Desktop for the modeling, you can extract the BIM file, right? So I can say, uh, you know, like if I'm here in in uh, here in Pabia Desktop, I'm going to say LM Toolkit, and then my target can be a BIM file, right? So I can I can make the target be a BIM file, and then every time I um, make a change or whatever, I can extract the data, I can put it in, in the BIM file, I can check it into source control, I can use, do my diff and merge, I can do automated deployment, uh, I can roll back to previous version, all of those things. But the problem is I can't reopen that in Pabe Desktop, right? So it's like a one-way street currently. And like we discussed earlier, we need to, we need to make Pabe Desktop uh, allow uh, external model changes uh, for, for us to get the full end-to-end uh, -end, uh, uh, picture where you can reopen it in Pabla. But you can at least extract the BIM file and, and check it into source control, but it's just a one-way street at the moment. Like I said, we, we really do need to correct this. And this is the same reason that you can't do download to PBIX. It's the same reason you can't 
download large models. It's the same reason you can't download incremental refresh models because like, if, as you saw, the incremental refresh generates like uh, hundreds of partitions. Well, Pabit Desktop doesn't know anything about partitions. If you look at the, you know, if 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 you if you look at the the um the uh the the metadata that the the if if I can show you the partitions that that Pabit Desktop creates, right? Uh, oh, sorry, I don't have the right um, model here. Uh, let me. I'll just show you. I'm going to make the the source and. Oh, sorry, I was comparing to the SSDT model. So I'm just going to make the source and the target be the Pabit Desktop. Um, so it's exactly the same, right? There's no differences, right? But if you look at like the, how does Pabit Desktop create a table, right? So let's look at say uh, the currency table, and then um, we come down here. You can see the partitions that Pabit Desktop creates, and it's got uh, this M expression in the partition, right? And uh, it, it's only got one partition. It doesn't. It, there's never Pabit Desktop. If if you if you were to to download a PBIX with like 100 partitions, like what is generated by incremental refresh in the service, then it would just break Pabit Desktop because it doesn't know how to handle multiple partitions, right? So, so Pabit Desktop just has one partition today. We need to make it work so that it doesn't, it, it allows multiple partitions. It allows you to, 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 to make changes to objects without breaking other objects and things like that. Because when it, when it does it, it's, when, when it knows that, Pabit Desktop was the tool that, that is doing the, the, the update. It, it's got some extra validation that only it, it knows about, right? So we just got this work that we need to do, and then we'll have the end-to-end -end flow with BIM files and automated deployment, diff and merge, and Pabit Desktop, including Pabit Desktop as the target, including rollback to previous version, et cetera. There isn't okay. another question currently. Okay, no worries. No worries. So I think we're good then. Hello, unless there's anything else you want to cover. Uh, actually, I'm expecting a few more questions. Uh, is, is, is there any plan to incorporate this tool into in, into Power BI desktop in, in in the near future? Because we do have too many external tools currently, which are great yeah. personally, yeah. but from yeah. my yeah. end point of user, uh, it's a little bit confusing. To be honest. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we, we do hear that feedback. So uh, there's nothing really in the short term, Halil, because it's going to take a, a long time to really make this happen. But we are uh, at very, we are actually in the process of funding pro, uh, uh, some significantly increase in the funding for pro development uh, mm -hmm. with Pabit Desktop. So I would expect this type of thing to light up in the not too distant future, uh, but there's nothing in the short term. And you know, even if we were to 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 get the funding and start developing and investing like tomorrow, it's going to take a little while for stuff to 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 show up because these are pretty big big rocks, big big items that we want to do. Uh, but we are definitely um, mobilizing for for that purpose. So I would expect something in the not too distant future, but not not very very short term. Six months, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe, maybe don't quote me on that, but maybe, yeah. yeah. And you know, like we light up new features all the time. Like uh, you know, we just we just lit up object level security uh, that you need tablet editor to to author that. But then there's other things like incremental refresh and aggregations. You, you know, there's there's support in Pabit Desktop for some of these pro features. Uh, so yeah, we're just going to pick up the pace, but uh, we're still finalizing the plan at the moment. I understand. Uh, that actually, I appreciate all the external tools that were created by Daniel and uh, other guys. Uh, the, the, the only downside of using these tools coming from my customers is all about it, it's external. Will Microsoft continue to support them forever? Yeah. And it's their big, biggest concern, I guess. I understand. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, we, we, we do hear that. I mean, these external tools like Tablet Editor, Dat Studio, LM Toolkit, they are very well supported because the, the individual authors do actually support them very well. But um, I can see from the kind of corporate decision making standpoint that sometimes you can't even get administrative rights on the machine or there may be group policy, et cetera. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I know we, we know this can be difficult. 
So okay. yeah, we do want to. We don't want to regret that. Okay, thanks a lot. A personal question. Yeah. How many How many languages do you speak? Uh, so let's see. I speak uh, uh, English a little bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I speak uh, uh, Portuguese because my mother is Brazilian, right? And once you know Portuguese, uh, it's a little. It's easier to learn things like Spanish, right? So I, I know I'm probably about 30% of Spanish, right? And, 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 and then I can, because I, because I learned English and Portuguese simultaneously, it wasn't like what there is, I don't have one first language, right? My first, my, I have two first languages, Brazilian and Portuguese. So I was speaking in two different accents from when I was uh, uh, a very young child, which then makes it easy to not only learn other languages, but also to pick up other accents. Uh, very easily. So, uh, so I can speak. Uh, Madame, Monsieur, j'adore pas bien. Car il est très joli. I can I can speak like with different accents quite easily uh, because of the fact that I was speaking in two different ang accents when I was like two years old, right? Uh, so, so the other ones I kind of pretend that I know them more than I really do. The only ones I really know is English, Portuguese, and about 30, 40 percent of Spanish. And uh, the, the other ones, I, I just pretend I know that I don't really know. I, ju I just know the accents and small, very small, limited vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you're a great talent in languages. I've seen you many times during the Ignites and uh, during yeah. the other webinars. You're a great speaker. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I love being able to talk in other people's language because it makes you, it, you, you, you get through to the, the person m m more directly. You know, you, 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 they feel more engaged, you know, like doing a, a presentation, you need to engage with the audience. And and that is a a, 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 a key to, to to get through to people, you know, so that, that's why that's why I like to use it. Thanks for that. If you are planning yeah. to learn Turkish, I can help you with that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll put it on my list. Next time I do a translations demo at uh, MBAS, I'll make sure I do. I work on my Turkish. Uh, thank you can you. help me. Yeah, you can help me. <laughs> with pleasure, with pleasure. All right. I, okay. uh, uh, I think we don't have uh, questions. Okay. Um, All right. Hello. Thank you. Thanks thank, again. Thank, uh, th thanks a lot, Christian. It was a great webinar. A great tool, really. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Okay. I hope to see you in person after all this is over. So thanks me, for me, all. Me too. Me too. Me too. Thank okay. you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.